Ah! Oh. My dad was worried we were doing so many beer beer ads <laughs> when we were like seven and ten years old. Podcast Junkies, episode 113. Welcome back. Took a little break last week. Uh, a lot of things going on here. I think um, one of the things is uh, some new clients that are coming on board that had uh, taken up a bit more of my time than I usually uh, thought they would. And I think it's just a matter of time management and doing a better job with that. But um, I did want to get these recorded and get these out, these intros and outros, because the interviews were actually recorded a while ago. So thanks for um, being patient and uh, glad to have you back. So this week we speak to Davey Rothbart. He's the host of uh, Found Podcast, which is another show that's part of the Wondery Network. Really some great shows that are coming out there and Hernan Lopez and team are, are doing a bang up job with Wondery. Uh, we spoke to Christine Blackburn, if you'll remember, of Storyworthy. That was episode 111. And then um, Davey Rothbart today. But if you missed last week, go back and check that out. That was with Natalie Jennings of A Face Project, and we just were talking about how we met at Podcast Movement and how I was raving about her magazine, print magazine, that came out as a result of her episodes, and she put her photography skills to really good use, and she's got a fantastic uh, product with the magazine, which I think a lot of podcasters can learn from that and also what she did with um, the ability to get a grant for her podcast was a pretty big deal as well so check that out as well uh, episode 112 with natalie jennings this week's episode is brought to you by podbean our newest sponsor i was checking out some of the stats on the site and i noticed that they had served 134,000 plus podcasters and delivered 3.4 million episodes and counting and 4.6 million, sorry, 4.6 billion downloads as of today, which is bananas. And I think it just speaks to the fact that they're a rock solid platform. So if you have a need for your own podcast, for an enterprise podcast, or you're looking to do some crowdfunding for your podcast, I highly recommend you give them a shot. The first 30 days are free. Head on over to podbean.com slash podcast junkies. And, uh, Take a look at all the services they're providing for podcasters to get started with their show. <laughs> so, uh, David Rothbart, thank you for joining us on Podcast Junkies. Yeah, great to be here, Harry. Um, so, as we were about to start the discussion, we were talking about Now Hear This, the conference coming up. It, by the time this airs, it'll probably have passed already. Yeah. And uh, and I'm sure you'll have be thinking back with fond memories of all the new connections you made at, at, at the conference. Sure. <laughs> And you were yeah. saying like you come from a writing background and it's, you know, it's an opportunity to get uh, out of the cave, uh, like you mentioned, <laughs> to, to, to meet people that you don't normally get to associate with because like you said, we, we spend so much time either behind a microphone or behind a, a, uh, a, a laptop trying to, yeah. c- trying to connect with people virtually. Yeah. And, you know, podcasting and radio is such an intimate medium. You, you know, you develop these deep relationships with the, the voices that you hear in your head. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's great when there's an opportunity to meet people in person and, and get to, uh, you know, get to hang out. What's your, what's your, um, what type of writing or how long have you been a writer? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I studied creative writing at college. I went to university of Michigan, um, in Ann Arbor, which is the town where I grew up. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I was always doing writing and journalism yeah, from high school, really, or before that. Um, so, you know, I, I've been a reporter for magazines like GQ and Grantland was a website that Bill Simmons and Dave Egger started a few years ago, wrote for them. And um, and and then I've also written like a book of short stories and, and a book of essays called My Heart is an Idiot and sort of my own personal essays about misadventures and love and relationships. And, um, so yeah, I mean, just, I brought it up because, you know, the writers work alone in their room and it can be isolating and antisocial. And so writers I've, you know, in my experience, a lot of my good friends are writers and, and they're rich storytellers, lusty drinkers. And 
it's awesome when they get together in mass. So, you know, I'm, I'm newer to the podcasting world, although I've been a fan of podcasts for a long time. And so, you know, I feel like any excuse to, to bring podcasters together is also great. There, there's a guy in LA named Ben Adair. He's yeah, a long, long time NPR producer. I'm sure you know, Ben, uh, most people are fond of his work as a journalist and also just him as a guy. He's such a, has such a lively, energizing mind. And, um, and so he, he started doing some kind of podcast meetups in LA and they've yeah. been really well attended and, and people have been having a blast. I think getting to get us to know each other. It's the pot. Yeah. Podcast and pizza. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. He's great. I've had him on the show. He was, uh, I gotta look up the episode number, but, uh, he was a lot of fun. We did it in person down here. Um, for the listener, Davey and I just discovered we're, we're neighbors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exa- exa- exactly. <laughs> we're, I'm in Silver Lake and he's in Echo Park. But, I, um, you know, Black Hat, the... Uh, uh-huh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. We did, the, uh, we did the interview there, so it was, it was fun. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, 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 he's uh, he's a Silver Lake guy, too. How much of the the glamorized picture of, um, you know, the, the, the boozing writer who's just... You know, goes on these benders, but ends up writing this prolific novel. And you know, these pictures, these, these people have of like you know the Hemingway types. How much of that st- still exists? I guess it couldn't. To the, in this day and age, you can't really be functioning alcoholic and, and do anything <laughs> that's going to be well, meaningful. I mean, you know, people forget, for example, that Jack Kerouac. You know, yes, he would travel around the country and and drink a ton and party in new orleans and san francisco and denver but then he would come home and stay with his mom in a little bedroom for eight months and barely leave you know and just write and maybe go out once a week to see his friends in new york city and come back and and so i don't know it i feel like a lot of the writers i know and myself are kind of like that where like you know when i when i wrote this book my heart is an idiot for example um you know, it would, it would, it would suck. It'd be the weekends. All my housemates were like going out to the bars and, and I'd be like, no, I got to finish this piece. I got to just stay in. So, you know, for me, it was more like I'd stay in for two or three weeks while I was writing a one essay or one, one piece. And then, you know, wild out for a week or two, yeah. <laughs> but, 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 um, but, you know, I think, I think that, you know, there's probably, probably a lot of crossover in, in terms of podcasters too. Cause you know, a lot of, a lot of the craft of creating podcasts can be, uh, you know, lonely, just, you know, yeah. in your room, editing tape that you've collected, trying to figure out the best way to structure a story. And so it's, it's a lot of fun to then go back out into the world and, and hang out with the people who are, who are doing the same kind of stuff. Yeah, it's something that I found uh, this I, this concept of a tribe because uh, there's a big podcasting conference called Podcast Movement. It was just in Chicago. Yeah, uh, sixteen hundred podcasters there. It's the third year awesome. they're doing it. It's interesting what happens is when you get all get in a room together and you start talking about oh your downloads or your microphone or how do you do interviews yeah. and, and we're just all speaking the same language for for three days. We're all geeking out on the same thing, and uh-huh. and it's just funny because you start to develop relationships with people. But we all have this idea of like wanting to help each other, which is pretty cool. Absolutely, it's a very supportive community. Um, people, whether they're you know some of the most the biggest most well known podcasts or somebody just starting out. I feel like there's a real sense of of um, fraternity and and kindred spirits. You know, you're, we're all pe- people aren't in podcasting because they want to be multimillionaires. You know, they're in it because they love storytelling and they love human connection. And you know, so we bring a bunch of those curious, kind-hearted people together, and good things happen. I'm curious if you had to draw a Venn diagram of like writers in one circle and podcasters in another. <laughs> that's and, a great. That's and, a great question. And then you mix them together. What would you end up with? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's a really. I think a lot of the they share a lot of characteristics, and there are a lot of writers who have really interesting podcasts, like Susan Orlean and her uh, Cry Babies podcast, and and so um, I think there. I think there's some crossover. Um, when, what was your, what's your earliest recollection of listening to podcasts? Well, I'll, let me start with my recollections of listening to radio because, because for me, they're a little bit inseparable. Um, I hold on. I don't don't want to make you have to make unnecessary edits. Are you picking up that? Yeah. That, that sound? Yeah. Um, that's okay. Okay. Is, is, is all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. 
it just it, it just makes it i mean i i've i've talked about this plenty of times on the show that uh i'm not trying to pretend like this is like okay we're in a studio, yeah, we're in a studio we're... and we have okay, to like yes. have this like i've they my listeners have heard my dog bark and they've heard the, the garbage truck backing up so Great, i may yeah. just even leave that whole thing in there as it is okay yeah do it do it yeah well it's funny that how it works you know like yeah. uh it's one thing to be in a in a fancy studio it's another the way you know we've done we do have access to a studio we use for some of our, our found podcast, but then often we record stuff just here at my dining table. And, yeah. uh, and so you deal with things like, yeah, this is a guy next door trying to mow the, <laughs> trying to mow the lawn. He was nice enough when I said, Hey, could you hold off for a few minutes? I think he went in the house, had a glass of coffee, had a cup of coffee, came back out 10 minutes later and picked back up. But and then, yeah, now he's all jacked up on coffee. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but but anyway, yeah, you asked about early early radio and podcast memories. So I I, I grew up. I had uh, I'm not that old. I'm yeah. 41. But but I I grew up with an AM only radio, which I was glued to around the clock. And so I listened to just you know talk shows out of WJR in Detroit. And I listened to even my dad gave me tapes of like old classic uh, radio shows like Evan Costello and the Green Hornet and Jack. Jack Benny and all that stuff. So I, I loved, I just loved radio. And I, me and my brothers used to like in our basement, we had a little boom box and we would record, make our own radio shows. Yeah. And uh, we even did it. Sometimes we do a road trip, you know, across Michigan or something. And, and in the backseat of the car, we'd be, we'd making ra- be making radio shows. Um, so I, I always loved radio and I always um, listened to a lot of radio, even though the programming now I think was probably, it, you know, it was like weird late night talk show. So I don't know what, I don't know what people are talking about. Maybe oh. Art, Art Bell. Was yeah, the... <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. UFO, Abominable Snowman. Uh, there there was uh, a lot of sports talk. Um, and, uh, but I was just always fascinated by, you know, the idea that, you know, you could broadcast stories and ideas. You know, later I got an, a radio that had FM on it too and started listening to a lot of NPR and, and that's when I hooked up with This American Life in uh, 2000 and worked with them on and off for about 10 years, reporting stories and, and helping produce other ones. And, uh, you know, podcasts just seem like a natural progression. I mean, you know, I, I especially, as somebody with a real DIY background, you know, I love zine culture and mm. people just not sort of waiting for anyone's permission to go out and create art but just saying hey i've got the tools i'm gonna go make it whether it's diy filmmaking or or publishing zines or music and so to me podcasting was awesome it was it was basically doing what me and my brothers have been doing in our basement as kids you know but you know at a little more uh proficient uh level you know and so so immediately i i you know started listening to a lot of podcasts and and um I don't know. It's just, uh, to me, it's been exciting now, you know, seeing people's excitement to create something, then break down barriers and having this massive audience, you know, become attracted to what is now available. Well, first, the first question that I had is when you talked about your radio show is if you had call letters for your radio show that you started. Oh, that's a great idea. I have to listen back to some of the, some of the uh, some of those little tapes. I don't know that we had. I don't know that we had like our name of our show or even like call letters. Uh, we did. We did do advertisements. I remember. Oh, really? We, like yeah, like 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 Stroh's beer. What, whoever advertised during the Tiger Detroit Tiger games, we would kind of like do our own little scoopy jingles. <laughs> well, that's funny because it, that that speaks to the the host red ad sponsors yeah. now and you guys, are, yeah. you guys yeah, are, we, we, we were doing host red ads when we were like seven years old before their time that's hilarious <laughs> my dad was worried we were doing so many beer beer ads <laughs> when we were like seven and ten years old so you so you talked about the zine culture so for uh, for the listener um uh, the found podcast actually started as a magazine and i'm wondering right. was the, was the found magazine your first foray into zines um, yeah, actually, I, th- I think so. Um, you know, I, I guess I had made little like comic books and stuff maybe in, in middle school and high school, but, but yeah, found, I started reading more and more zines and then, um, in 2001 put out the first issue of found magazine 
And it was just, you know, notes and letters that people had found on the ground, found on the street, like these actual love letters and to-do lists and journal entries. People, you know, pe- my friends knew I collected this stuff, so they would always give me stuff they found. And I, and I had my own collection, and, and I just thought, wouldn't it be cool for everyone to share what they're finding with everybody else? And so we made this really, you know, a homemade zine, you know, scissors and tape, you know, stapled together at Kinko's. And, um, and, and people got really excited, and it was amazing to see – you know how to see to watch it take off, and for people all over the country and around the world to start sending us their their found notes and you know each one some of them are hilarious, some of them are, are heartbreaking, and each one really gives you this powerful glimpse into another person's life. Uh, there, there was one note that kind of sparked the idea to do it in the first place, and it, it was on the windshield of my car. Um, my my name's Davey, but on my windshield was this note addressed to Mario, <laughs> and it said. <laughs> Mario, I effing hate you. You said you had to work. Then why is your car here at her place? You're a liar. I hate you. I hate you. Signed, Amber. P.S. Page me later. And I just thought it was, you know, amazing. Like, she's so angry and upset with him, but still kind of hopeful and in love. Yeah. And so, you know, and of course, it wasn't even Mario's car. It was my car. So... (laughs) I started showing that to my friends and, you know, they would show me like a, a Polaroid they found in the gutter, a, a kid's drawing yeah. that they'd always save for years and, and found magazine just seemed like a way that, you know, people could share this stuff with each other and kind of, you know, wonder about, you know, what is the story behind this? How did you distribute it in the early days? Yeah, just, um, a lot of mostly indie bookstores, you know, uh, around the U S would stock it. Um, it was very DIY. Um, you know, friends of mine in Minneapolis or, or New Orleans or Tulsa, they'd be like, Oh, there's this spot near my house. I think might be a cool place to carry found. We'd send them a bunch of copies on consignment and they would sell them and send us, you know, a couple bucks a piece. And, and, um, it definitely wasn't, I always thought of it and still do as this kind of, um, massive like community art project and not so much like a business type of thing, you know, but, um, but it was great to see it continue to grow. And, you know, Tower Records, which at the time, you know, they had hundreds of stores around the world. They decided to carry it. So all of a sudden it's being carried in Japan and Sweden and South Africa. Wow. And, then um, you know, the other big bookstore chains came in and started carrying it. And then we did some found books. And But, I mean, I, it, it definitely took a huge amount of DIY energy. And, you know, like my, my brother Peter and I, we would do these tours where I would – we would travel around the country. We'd go to like 70 cities over three months. We'd, we'd find a bookstore or a cafe or, or wherever we could, you know, a little bar or theater to do a, a kind of a live found show where I would read some of the found notes and letters. My brother w- would play songs based on these found notes, and he's kind of this incredible musician. And, and so, you know, that would get people excited. It would give the local press something to, to write about to help us spread the word. And usually we'd find a store or two in town that was willing to carry – the magazine. And so, you know, people would just kind of discover it on the shelf at, at their local record shop or whatever. And, and, um, and it just, yeah, it grew in a really organic grassroots kind of way. Were there any specific like inflection points where you felt like there was really an awareness of, uh, the magazine, like, you know, people were telling you like someone maybe famous had, had found it or talk, was talking about it or there yeah. was just one specific like item or story that really for some reason or other, you know, resonated a lot with people. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think I can answer both of those kind of separately. Like, I mean, there were definitely times when, you know, I never thought of found, I thought of it as a cool project that I was excited to share with people, but I never thought of it as a story itself to be covered by media. And so in 2002, about a year after you know, we'd released only two issues, um, but uh, the New Yorker contacted me and they wanted to do like an article about found and and so it was it was a talk of the town section. But I remember with their their great writer Ted Friend like walking around the East Village and he wanted to kind of go on a finding mission with me. And I was kind of nervous because I I explained to him like it's not exactly how it works. You can't yeah. just roam around a neighborhood and find something amazing. It's more like if you're looking every day, then over time you'll find good stuff. But he was like, "Well, let's see what we can find." And and we did find a couple moderately cool things. And he wrote this really beautiful piece, and that kind of seemed to strike people. And 
and get the word out in a, in a big way. Um, and then, you know, a year or two later, like, uh, David Letterman had us on, uh, actually, you know what, before that, this American life, I did, I did a live tour with Ira Glass, David Sedaris, Starley Kine, um, and, uh, Sarah Vowell and also Jonathan Goldstein. Um, and, uh, and we, you know, so of course, you know, you're performing with Ira Glass and David Sedaris, you know, these are like 3000 person theaters. And of course it was aired on this American life too. So all of a sudden that was another big boost for sure. That was in 2003. And then 2004 Letterman had me on twice to like, you know, read finds, you know, share some of these amazing finds. Some of them that will make you tear up because they're so sad. Some of them will make you, you know, cry with laughter. Like they're, these finds themselves are, are the stars of the show. You know, they're really incredible. These are real people sharing real stories that they never thought anybody else would read other than the person they're writing to. And so, but, but each of those times, all of a sudden you saw it kind of blow up and, and a new audience being introduced to found magazine and, 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 you know, everything, you know, everything that we were doing with found. Um, and then, and then there was also, you asked about certain stories. I mean, I think, I think there was, you know, favorite finds of mine and they've shifted over time, but, um, there's favorite finds that have particularly resonated with people. There was one I, I shared on the, this American life tour. Um, there was a couple, actually, there was one about, there was an algebra test that was found just floating down the street in Portland, Maine. And this kid obviously was having some troubles with algebra. Um, his teacher gave him a zero out of a hundred on the test, but, but he, he had these really clever responses. Like he didn't know the answers, but he decided to, you know, kind of draw pictures and write these hilarious punchline like responses. And, you know, if that was my student, I would give him an A plus, you know, best grade in the class or at, le or at least put a note like, Hey, you need to work on your math skills, but I appreciate your, your creative spark. But the teacher was kind of humorless, just gave him a zero. And, uh, and he ended with this whole series of rhymed couplets. That was one that, that definitely captured people's imagination. The kid's name was Aaron Harmon. And I remember like people wanted to start like a Aaron Harmon scholarship fund and all this stuff to like help raise money, send this kid to college. Um, there was a sadder one, um, a, a kid from Erie, Pennsylvania, who was writing a letter to his dad in Arizona. And he's, it's not clear if his dad was just in jail or, or recently out of jail. And he's kind of, Sit, telling his dad, I want to come visit you. I want to, you know, we can, we can have a lot of fun. You know, he's telling him about his, his cooking skills. I can cook mm -hmm. us some meals. We can have a blast. But, um, but then he wonders like, dad, why haven't you written me back? Is it because you don't have stamps? If you don't have stamps, I'll send you some stamps. And you kind of realize what the kid who wrote this letter doesn't seem to, which is that if his, you know, if his dad's not writing it back, it's not because, he doesn't have a stamp, you know, it's like, there's something else going on there. How'd you get, how'd you, how'd you first get into podcasting? Um, I went to a conference and I went, I actually, I'm a fan of electronic music. And so I went to a conference yeah. to start a podcast interview DJs. Cause I had a mobile app called know your DJ. Yeah. And then I, I went there and I realized how hard it was going to be to get in touch with the DJs that I really wanted to interview. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then I said, uh, "Look at all these podcasters here." So let me interview. Let me interview podcasters. It's uh, it's awesome. It's kind of meta. So it's been two and a half years, hundred plus interviews, and it's you've it's, interviewed such an awesome range of people. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because it's all they have to have in common is have a podcast. But it's interesting because everyone's got a unique path that got them to where they are now as as host of their own show. Yeah, I'm wondering if. How, if there's any, if there's been a story where, in your, in the process of you digging into it, that you've developed like a personal connection to it, because I imagine a lot of these, you know, I I've listened to the to the ones that are on the show, and I and I, I you know, there's some that are already resonating with me, like Found Baby. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. I want to see the picture, I want to see what the kid looks like. I went to Facebook, yeah. I was like, I gotta know, because <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. there's this you, there's this thing about this human nature, like to like about stories, not only hearing the stories, but I think if you get sucked into the story you want to know how it turned out and i'm wondering how if any of these kind of re resonated with you personally where you maybe you got a little more uh involved in the story than you thought you would yeah i mean absolutely i think um a good example of that is is biggs so biggs there was a, a few years ago somebody sent me this 
photo they'd found in Florida. It was kind of like a promotional photo for some aspiring rapper, this guy named Biggs. And, you know, there's a few pictures of him, and you, you, you don't even know if it's if he's a rapper or, like, a pro wrestler or what the, what the photos are advertising, but I couldn't find him online. I had this picture on my desk for years. I was wondering about, you know, what's this guy's story? And um, just this giant white dude wearing a white bandana and looking, kind of trying to look tough, but you can tell there's kind of a sweetness to him. And, um, you know, I was Googling around. I couldn't find anything more about him. And then eventually I was able to track him down. And he, it turns out that he worked at a – he managed a pizza joint that was like 20 minutes from my house oh, in wow. Ann Arbor where I used to live. And so I, I managed to get in touch with him and, and, and hung out with him. And I just love the guy. Like he was, he was very, you know, he had, he had been an aspiring rapper whose kind of rap career had, had dwindled, but he, you know, and he'd kind of been selling drugs and decided to go straight and, you know, make a life, you know, in a legit job working at a pizza shop. And, and it, it resonated with me because not only do I love rap music, but I, I also worked at a pizza shop for years in high school and college and, um, and had a lot of good friends that still worked at, at the shop where I, where I'd grown up. And so anyways, we hung out and, and I, you know, we became really, really good friends actually. And, um, recently I've been working on a film project. I'm like, so into bigs and his story. We, we, he's, he's a, a voice that appears briefly in, in episode one yeah. of the, found, of the found podcast, as we're trying to track down a guy who, who calls himself the Asian Oprah, um, in Chicago and try to, you know, see what he's up to, you know, years after pitching all these entertainment companies, his plan to become the Asian Oprah. We were trying to track him down. I'd make a little detour and spend and visit Biggs. But, um, but, but meanwhile, I've been working on a film project with Biggs. Um, we have this Oscar nominated director who's, um, who loves Biggs' story. And, and, uh, and so we've been collaborating on uh, writing a script and, and, you know, it's, it's not, Biggs's life story exactly, but it's based on Biggs's uh, personality and, and some of it, some of the things he's gone through, um, and so that's that's an example of just. I mean, if you think about it, it's insane. Like somebody found a photo in a desk drawer on the side of the road in Florida. They sent it to me. I found the guy. Now I'm working on a film. You know, it, we'll we'll have this film in a, in a year or two come out. With, mm. You know, based on on this guy's real life, so, um, and you know, it's like that. You mentioned the found baby. I mean, <clears throat> this story is incredible. You know, that's when you talk about want stories that move you and and stick with you. I mean, these two, this guy, the serendipity there is is even more incredible. You yeah, know, yeah. this guy he's in New York City. He's this is the third episode of the Found podcast. Re- revolves around these two guys' story, Danny and Pete. You know, going to his boyfriend, going to meet his boyfriend for dinner, takes the subway across Manhattan. As he's getting off the, as he's leaving the subway station, sees under a bench something moving. Looks like a little baby doll, but it's not a doll. It's a real life baby. And so he, you know, what do you do? You know, he picks the baby up, tries to find the police. He calls his boyfriend. Boyfriend rushes down, you know, rushes over, and you know they give the baby to the police. They figure that's the end of it. They'll never see it. They'll never see the baby again. They hope it has a good life, until you know that they get called in to testify in front of the judge at some hearing a few months later. You know, when and and the judge suggests, well, why don't why don't you guys adopt the baby? And, and they've never even thought about it. Yeah. These guys are even barely. You know, they they don't even live. You know, they I think they they live together with a third roommate who lives behind a curtain in the living room. You know, they're not prepared. They're they're not married. They're not prepared for. Um, they're not really prepared to be fathers, and yet they say yes, and they they lead them on this journey of of parenthood, and and so anyway, th- th- those guys' story is is and the story of their son Kevin is is incredible, and it's it's one of my favorite found stories ever, but. You know, honestly, every week when I open the mail, see what people have sent to Found Magazine, see what some of the Found Podcast listeners have, have emailed us about, you know, there's there's a new kind of unbelievable but true story to to learn about. So it's 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 really it's really it's really fun. 
how much, I mean, you've probably got this whole other audience of people that may not have even known about the magazine. And because, you know, podcasts are so ubiquitous now that they simply found you, you know, either yeah. through, through the network or just, uh, you know, recommendations. And now you almost have this whole new team of researchers working for you guys and sending you content. Has that just dramatically increased the, 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 yeah. the, the notes you receive? Yeah, I mean, we've always received a lot of finds from readers of the magazine, but definitely like having Wondery put found out, you know, into the world in such a big way. Now, exactly, we're you know, not everybody has a cool indie bookstore in their town, yeah. you know, and, and would have discovered Found Magazine on their own. But anybody anywhere can download a podcast, you know, and so yeah, we've had people who are discovering Found for the first time and and are sharing their own stories. And yeah, I mean, like it is, it's this community art project. It's, it's, it's thousands of people's finds, you know, the notes and letters they're finding or the stories they have about some interesting find that changed them in some way. You know, people often write to me and they say, you know, I don't know if I found this thing or if this, if this thing found me because Mm -hmm. they feel so changed by something that, they discovered floating down the street, you know, yeah. they feel like the universe maybe sent it to them yeah. because it seems to unlock, you know, some, some question they were struggling with in their own lives. Yeah, it's really interesting. I was wondering, as I was listening to some of the episodes, if there's like a, if there's overarching themes, I mean, there's a, there's a stream of them that sort of have this idea of like unfulfilled dreams, right? When you talk about bigs and you talk about, uh-huh. you know, the, the, the Asian Oprah and yeah. these people like, were at one point, one place in their lives where they, you know, they thought sort of thought their life was going to be different than it turned out, and yeah. And then when you go there and, and you see them, I imagine when you see them in person and and you bring back this memory of them that they thought was just forever gone. That, that, that you know they're sort of transported back to this time when like maybe they were a bit more innocent and more ambitious. Yeah, totally. I mean, well, that, and that that's to me that was that was the whole premise of the Found podcast. You know, it was like, look, you know. These notes, you know, somebody could write a to-do list and lose it. And and it might be something really fascinating. You know, there might be some interesting items on there. It might reveal something about who that person is or, or who, you know, we might imagine them to be a certain way based on this little to-do list that they lost yeah. 10 years ago in their hometown in Idaho or, or Nebraska. Well, I've wondered about the authors of these notes for years. You know, some of them were in the early issues of Found Magazine some you know, and I've wondered like, what are these people really like? What's their what's their real story? And so, to finally meet all of the people who I've wondered about for so long has been a total trip, and it's a trip for them. Yeah. To be reunited with this piece of paper that they wrote like a decade ago, and um, and and so. You know, and, and, and like you said, it, it brings them back to a place in their life when, you know, before they took a fork in the road, you know, and they see some earlier version of themselves. It's like a, it's like a time capsule for, uh, for an, one person, you know, and, and so people sort of become instantly disarmed and, and open and vulnerable, you know, talking about, you know, part of their life that, you know, maybe they, they, they had kind of left behind in some way and now they're plunged back into that moment when they wrote that love note or that to-do list or journal and and uh and people so people have been very willing to share some pretty personal stories with me a a lot of the found notes are very personal you know what inspires somebody to take a pen and and start you know writing a this you know a passionate letter you know you you have to be feeling especially as technology has evolved and less and less handwritten letters um you know you have to you have to feel inspired to really share some personal emotional thing, you know? And so the letters are raw and personal and very truthful and revealing. It's interesting because as you were talking about that, I was transported back to moments when, you know, when like like one of my early girlfriends and we would write cards to each other or she, I remember I went went to my parents' house back in New York uh, probably a couple years ago. And at some point I was like, okay, I got to clean out some of this stuff. And I would, 
I unearthed like these, you know, they would give you these oversized cards for your birthday <laughs> if you're a girlfriend and they just write these long notes. Oh, and, I, yeah. and, I, and I tossed the majority of the stuff out, but I'm wondering like how much of it is floating around to be found <laughs> by someone <laughs> to send over to yeah. your, your podcast. Check, check out, you gotta, who knows, you may be the subject of a future found <laughs> podcast or found magazine. Um, no, I mean, I, I was the same way. I, I, I was a prolific note writer. Um, those, you know, those letters are physical pieces of paper. I mean, they exist in the world somewhere and yeah. usually they're stored in a box in someone's attic, but sometimes that house gets sold and, and those boxes are put out on the street and the wind carries them, mm -hmm. you know, into the path of, of another person who, who, who discovers it and, and often shares them with, with found, you know, if anyone listening right now ha has found a, a great postcard or letter or or post-it note, you know they can go to foundmagazine.com and find our address. You know where they can they can they can uh, send us the actual found item. Yeah. There's a there's a iOS app on Found where they can upload it. You know or, or, or submit it over email. Um, and that's how you know that's how we get the stories for our, our podcast just from from people who are listening. I was thinking uh, the like the benefits of you mentioning that you've been you've been able to reach out to the people who are in the stories is that a function of you know some maybe some resources that you now have available to you because of, you've partnered up with Wondery? Yes, I mean I would say there's a couple factors. I mean Wondery's been great and working with Hernan Lopez and his awesome team has been a real thrill. Like these guys are doing it right. Um, they you know they're really I, you know, I just love their passion for for good storytelling, and um, and they're nice folks to boot. Um, so you know, having a producer like Julia Smith, who I've been working with, you know, you know, we have it's not just me anymore. You know, it's like it's it's not not that it ever was just me. We I've found magazine. I've had this awesome team that I've been working with for years and years. And um, but I mean, having other people who can help dig into these stories and say like, how can we track these people down? That's been a big boost, but but actually, I'd say the biggest thing has just been, you know, the rise of internet searches. You know, like yeah. it it was a different era, two thousand one, when we started Found Magazine. The internet was was emerging, but but you know, you couldn't just search anyone's name and and learn how to track them down. Now, it, it, you know, this, a lot of the steps become easier. You know, not not every found note includes a full name. Some of them there are no identifying details and. We may never find the authors. I may never find Mario and Amber, you know, who, who Amber who wrote that note that was left on my windshield that kind of sparked the idea for Found Magazine in the first place. You know, there there may not be enough information to try to find her, just a first name and a neighborhood in Chicago. But but if someone's full name is on there, yeah, we could, we could probably find them, you know. And so that's 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 I'd say been the, been the biggest boost. What's interesting is this in this world we live in now where people are posting their statuses on Facebook and relationships they had in the past. And even though in Facebook you change your status when you break up with uh -huh. your it's, it's kind of crazy how your whole dating life is now. <laughs> your right, history right. of your dating, dating life. I, I imagine Facebook in some back-end server is actually keeping the whole history so, <laughs> <laughs> of like, oh, well, engage in a relationship, not in a relationship. It's complicated. Like it's... <laughs> If you were well, to play play that back, it'd be kind of trippy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot. You know, to me, it, it adds to you know. Found, we're very careful. These are people's personal yeah. stories. They're real notes. Our our goal isn't to embarrass anybody or out them. You know, for for something crazy or personal or or raw that they may have written. It's to kind of just experience a human story. So we in the magazine we change the note the names and identifying info but still when people send me finds and the ones that i find the most interesting i'm always curious to google the person and you know part, part of part of the joy and mystery of found notes is imagining what the story might be behind it yeah but it can also be fun to actually look online see if you can figure out what is the real story you know and sometimes even reach out to those that to that person yeah i think one in one of the stories you mentioned you were looking at the you found the person online, but there was no connection, and then you were starting to figure out who liked the picture that he was in, and then yeah. you, you was like, "Do I know someone who's liked the picture?" And I think through some detective work, you were able to finally yeah. like make a connection. Well, because exactly. So, all right, picture. 
we have to figure out that one of the biggest challenges and kind of fun parts of it, but it's, it can be interesting, is to figure out how do we contact somebody and say, hey, so first explain what Found Magazine is and then and the Found Podcast. We found, you know, somebody in Iowa found a letter you wrote 12 years ago. Um, we published it in a magazine. We, we were going to feature it on a podcast. Can we talk to you about it? You know, so, and of course, if you send someone a Facebook message, actually, sometimes they won't even receive it unless you're already like friends with them. So, so yeah, what I, 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 <laughs> I just take to some like Facebook sleuthing where, uh, I would like look on someone's Facebook page, look at all of their friends or all the people that, that liked the pictures that they'd posted and see it. Do I have a mutual friend with any of these people? I mean, basically, is there somebody in this person's life that yeah. can vouch for us? Tell them we're not complete crazies. We're not stalkers. You know, we're legit people that, you know, journalists, I guess I would say, yeah. who you know want to hear their real story and, and, and present it in a respectful way. But sometimes it helps to have an in with somebody who they already know and trust. Very cool. Uh, so I'm I'm wondering about your, I mean your background or or you know when you were growing up and you decided you wanted to to be a writer, and now as as you've moved into this you know transition with the show and and telling people stories, I mean is that something that you've had for as far back as you can remember this desire to kind of communicate you know your your thoughts, get them onto paper initially, and now you know through through the podcast through the spoken word. I've always been interested in other people's stories. Um, I think it comes through, in, in some ways it comes through my parents. Um, my dad is one of these gregarious dudes from, he's from Brooklyn, just, you know, never met a stranger, just chat. It's almost embarrassing. He acts like a drunk person acts, but he doesn't drink. Right. Like, like he'll just start chatting with strangers, you know, on the sidewalk at a, at a restaurant, the people at the next table. And it's just like, sometimes it's embarrassing, but at the same time, it's really awesome because he, He's curious about people's stories. He'll ask a lot of questions, and he'll make friends everywhere he goes. You know, my mom, she's a meditation teacher, and she's also a, like a spiritual counselor, and um, she channels this ancient spirit really? named Aaron. Yeah, I, I did this this American Life kind of story that investigates her channeling one, one time, and um, but people call her from all over the country seeking advice, and and she's also deaf, so. When I was a little kid, now she has a phone that can kind of translate for people, like kind of a voice to text type of thing. But as a kid, she needed me or one of my brothers to translate for her. So, so literally, I'd be like five, six years, seven years old, and people would be spilling. You know, maybe they just had a marriage end after twenty years, and they had to talk to like a seven year old kid, me, and tell me what you know. They'd be sobbing, telling me the story, so I could then. Sign, use sign language to translate it to my mom. Wow. And she would get on the phone and kind of help them through these issues. But, but certainly being at such like a point blank range on all these wide, varied human stories was, was really, you know, I think, um, shaped, shaped me in a lot of ways. And, and so, you know, it just made me give me a sense for all the, emotions and stories that people go through and and um and so as i got older i kept kind of seeking out those kinds of stories um whether just talking to strangers like my dad or 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 being like my mom and and digging into re the real things in people's lives and and kind of getting past the small talk it's i mean it seeing where you are now it, it's it, it's almost it's so obvious that how those you know how those two people affected your life in such a way it's you know that the combination of those two really like it kind of made you who you are now because you know you have that that empathetic empathetic aspect mm -hmm. of you and then this mixed with the storytelling and and it sort of like almost describes what's happening with found it's crazy yeah yeah no absolutely um i think my my parents understood found from the beginning because uh um we as Julia, Julia Smith, the producer, and I, as we're, as we're working on each of the episodes for, for the Found Podcast, we kind of created a Google document that, that kind of has the narration in there and also some of the transcripts of interviews. And, you know, so my mom, who's deaf, one of the nice things has been I've been able to share those documents with her because she can't listen to the podcast, oh, yeah. obviously. 
We, we featured her on, on episode four of the podcast. Yeah, talking I remember. About, you're talking about your mom was uh, deaf, and I'm like, where have I heard that story before? Oh, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I was like, the yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah. she shared the story of, of <laughs> yeah. losing her hearing at, at age 29. But um, but she can't listen to the podcast, but she can read these um, she can read our you know these kind of scripts for each episode and and follow along. And I think she, you know, I think she sees that the work I'm doing and the work she does are, are have some similarities. Very cool. A uh, couple other questions. Yeah. What do you, What do you think is the most uh, misunderstood thing about you? About me? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know my public self well enough to really answer that gracefully. I, I guess the one thing that comes to mind is I noticed on some YouTube videos of myself like doing found shows. I, I noticed people like talking about my like drinking problem or what they perceived it to be. And I don't know, I, I'm, look, I have a lot of friends with you know, drug and alcohol abuse issues and, you know, I've like, um, been very close with like, to like addiction. I know what it is and I don't know, it, it doesn't really rankle me that, um, that people would think that I, I think I like to drink when I'm performing cause it makes me funnier and more entertaining, I guess. Yeah. But when I'm reading these found notes at these kinds of live found shows that we often do, yeah. but, um, but 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 I but I, I find it it's kind of amusing that like so many people like think that I'm like a complete drunkard. But like you said, we talked about this earlier, like, you know, yeah, you you know, there's you kinda have to like mix and match, you know, you go out and have a fun time for a week or two and then you come home and kinda work for a while, you know? Did the story about uh the rent rent a friend, um the guy who made the videotape <laughs> Yeah, he he was an AA, right? Yeah, that was a that was, he he kind of used coded language to describe it, but yeah. but yeah, so that that that's an amazing. It's episode six of the Found Podcast. Um, it's this video VHS tape, this incredible VHS tape. This guy in the eighties made this tape where he called Rent a Friend, where you could buy this tape, stick in your VCR, and he would talk to you. But it, it's like a one sided conversation because yeah. he doesn't know what you're how you're responding. He's just like, hey, what's your name? oh cool you know like it's it's hilarious tape it's trippy and, and so we found the guy you know 30 years later who had created that tape and and he yeah he told us to share his journey of recovery really you know alcohol and and um and other and other things that he that had plagued him and and that he seems to have you know you know he's he's, he's He's been very productive, and he became ended up becoming a, a TV host, and and did a lot of other cool stuff. But um, but hearing that story from him was, I thought I thought fascinating. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm 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 working on a new documentary that kind of has a, a at, its, at its heart an addiction story too. Those stories have always interested me. I'm like very lucky that I don't have a gene, an addiction, a really addictive gene. Um, because I, I think I would be a great candidate for addiction myself, but, um, but I'm, but I find myself really interested in stories of addiction and, and people, you know, persevering and finding a way to, uh, to through, through into recovery. Do you, is there an aspect of you that likes wearing your heart on your sleeve? Cause with a, with a title, like, um, my, my, my heart is an idiot, I imagine. <laughs> Yeah, There's yeah. Discharge. Yeah, I, I pretty much do wear my heart on my sleeve. Um, in Found Magazine and on the Found Podcast, you know, we've shared people's very personal stories, stories that they didn't even necessarily intend to be shared in that way. You know, just a a love letter, a, a journal. You know, something they thought no one else would see. So I thought, if I'm going to share everyone else's most personal stories in Found, mm -hmm. the only fair thing to do is to share my own. So that's what. My heart is an idiot. It, there's some pretty embarrassing, um, crazy adventures I've had, and and I would say, I'm I'm definitely not painted as the hero in in them. <laughs> I'm I'm painted as I'm painting myself as you know honestly I think which is you know often as a, as a fool and as someone who's made some pretty bad mistakes and but I think you know human mistakes, and I think I think gone through things that other people can relate to and find you know everybody's heart has been an idiot as at one time or another oh yeah <laughs> and so so i'm not so i'm not afraid to wear my heart on my sleeve and 
almost wear it like a badge of pride <laughs> um, and say my heart is an idiot. And it's been neat to see the response from people. And, and when you do share some of your own most personal stories, it, it, you might feel very vulnerable, but actually people people of all ages and, and backgrounds have, you know, approached me and just said, you know, written me emails, come, come, met me at events and, and shared personal stories with me. If anything, the great thing about it is when you, when you share so many personal stories, people feel like they know you, which, yeah. which is true. They do know, they do know you in a way because they've, they've read about all these experiences you've, you've been through. And so they feel very eager and, and very willing, I would say, to, to share their stories with you. And that's something I love because I, I love hearing people's stories. So I appreciate when people will just jump right into it. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it just humanizes you and it makes you, you know, you don't have this facade and, and it just shows us that we're yeah. all, we all have, you know, these things that, you know, we probably are embarrassing if, if we, if we have the courage to tell people about them. But then when we do tell them, we find that we connect people on a more personal level. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. No, you put it beautifully. That's exactly right. What's uh, something you've changed your mind about recently? Let's see. Something I've changed my mind. These are great questions. I started trying to eat better. I, I don't eat terribly. I don't eat like candy or pop or whatever, but I, I love vegetables so much. I, so I've just been like trying to eat more of them. I guess they're supposed to be good for you or something. <laughs> I, keep, I, keep, I keep hearing, but I, I, I like the taste of them. I just never really thought about what I put in my body. And so I guess I'm you know, trying to eat better. That, this is as of like two days ago. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just recently became a vegetarian about uh, cool. two months ago. So it's, it's interesting because once you've made the shift, yeah, you don't, really feel like people f feel more bad for you because you're a vegetarian right, right. <laughs> and you're yeah. like, no, I'm okay with it. I'm good. I can find something on the menu. And then you just start to expand your, yeah. your, your palate and go to yeah. different places. Like there's a place called cafe gratitude that makes ridiculously amazing, like vegetarian and vegan dishes. And you just discover new places. Yeah. Yeah. I went to the elf cafe recently. Also said that place was awesome. And, yeah. and, um, yeah, so you know, I, I I may be following your lead here <laughs> here before too long. Well, uh, I think that's a good enough of a place as any to to wrap this up. I know you've got a lot of things going on that are um, uh, related to the show. You've got a a live show coming up as well. So you want to talk yeah. about that for a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this may I know this may air after after the not here this festival, but um, gonna do we're gonna record one of our found podcast episodes live at the Now Here This Festival in Anaheim in late October. And, uh, you know, we also have the Found Musical yeah. is, is opening in Philadelphia November 9th. And uh, this this is amazing. I mean, this is these are actors from Hamilton, from um, American Idiot, from um, Wicked, and they're and they're they're they've created this incredible musical based on found magazine and the kinds of stories that we have in the found podcast and so i saw they did it off broadway at the atlantic theater last year and now it's opening in philly so that that's gonna be a lot of fun i'm gonna go next month to go check that out and um yeah i you know we've got four more episodes coming out um of the found podcast which is gonna be 12 episodes total for the first season okay. and it's been really cool you know a lot of people caught wind of it right out of the gate yeah. And then every day new people are, are learning about, you know, I appreciate you having me on and spreading word too. And a lot of it's just the same way as the magazine started. It's just a lot of word of mouth, people listening to a couple episodes and getting, getting hooked and wanting to share it with their friends. And that makes all the difference to us. So, um, uh, it's, it's nice now that, now that we've been going and there's eight episodes out, people who discover it for the first time, they actually have some back episodes they can go listen to, you yes. know? So, um, yeah, and, and hopefully they can become a part of the show by finding something and sharing it with us. Yeah, hopefully they now they've got their um, eyes open because a lot of times, like you said, we're so busy on our phones and we're like, instead of doing that, just put the phone away and just look on the street. You never know <laughs> what you might have just walked over. It, exactly. Well, yeah, once, once you start looking, you, you really do find incredible things. Um, are any of the stories that are on the podcast making their way into the play? Uh, that's a great question. You know, the, the writers of the musical, uh, Hunter Blair, this Tony-nominated playwright, and, and Lee Overtree, I know they've been listening carefully to the podcast. I don't know, you know, I don't know if any specific storylines we've yeah. uncovered recently have entered the play yet, but I, I will say the the tone of the stories, you know, and the the 
the curiosity, that the, the the range of wild characters you meet, those are all things that are reflected in the play. Absolutely. That well, sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. I I think uh, hopefully it gets expanded and it gets shown in other cities. At something yeah, like yeah, that. I, 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 that will definitely happen. That will definitely happen. So people who are listeners of the Found Podcast, wherever they might live, they'll get a chance to see yeah. the Found Play play, and, and they should seize that chance because it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> Sounds like it's gonna be a lot of fun. Well, David, thank you, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. I, I, I'm, I think the listeners learned a little bit about the show, but more important, a little bit about you and uh, your inspiration for for starting the magazine and the show. Well, I really appreciate your your in depth line of questioning. <laughs> it's it's really generous, and uh, I love what you're doing. You know, uh, shining a spotlight on so many people doing really cool stuff in in the podcast universe. So. So it's it's great to great to meet you, man, and uh, look forward to hanging in person before too long, too. Yeah, considering we're neighbors. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. So, where's the best place for folks to track you down online? Um, probably uh, foundmagazine.com. Uh, that's the best place. Uh, Facebook and Twitter, Davy Davy Rothbart, and um, yeah, those those kinds of things. Like they'll they can learn about Google if they Google me, they can find out about some of the films I've been working on and and some of the other cool stuff we have in the works next. Very cool. Sounds like you got a lot of cool stuff in the works. Uh, best of luck. Yeah, thanks Thanks again, Harry. So that was such a great conversation with Davey. I love how he went all over the map, if you will. We talked about his background as a writer and this idea of um, having early memories of radio in Detroit and how that really formed his, his thoughts about what he wanted to do later on in life. Um, the early days of Found Magazine were pretty cool as well. And that whole conversation about his parents, uh, that was an unexpe- unexpected turn in the conversation, and I was pretty happy with where it went. So I'm really get- glad he he uh, offered that information up, and I think it just added a lot more dimension to the interview. So I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. So we are a member of Podcastica. Head on over to podcastica.com to check out all the shows on the network. You might want to also check about, check out, check about, <laughs> check about, check about, bow. check out Ron Dawson's um, show that he just wrapped up with his, uh, his friends called Wrestling uh, with Westworld. Um, and it's about, uh, I think it might be one of the only uh, shows about Westworld that are with uh, total African-American uh, hosts and co-hosts. It's really funny. I had uh, a blast listening to the whole, to the first season. Unfortunately, we've got to wait until 2018 for the next season of Westworld, but if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Don't forget to visit podbean.com slash podcast junkies. If you're thinking of starting a podcast or looking for a great home for your show, don't forget you'll get one month free if you sign up with the special URL and you can try all of Podbean's great hosting features. Podbean.com slash podcast junkies. Intro and outro music by my friend George Abiana, aka Cedar and Soil. Check out cedarsoil.com. You can always subscribe to the podcast at podcast podcastjunkies.com. And remember that I'm looking for feedback uh, via SpeakPipe for this, these past couple of episodes. So we'll, we'll keep the trend going. Head on over to podcastjunkies.com and you'll see on the right-hand side a little tab where you can click on and leave me a comment that I'll be more than happy to play um, at the end of this episode right around this time. The hashtag is going to be... Uh, found Davy. Davy can be found at Davy Rothbart, D-A-V-Y-R-O-T-H-B-A-R-T. And I can be found as always at podcast underscore junkies. So thanks for checking out the podcast this week. Look to be back on track. Uh, Stay tuned next week when we speak to Rob Dion, and he's the host of the Open Sky Fitness Podcast. We also got to connect, reconnect at Podcast Movement and uh, had an interesting conversation, which I think uh, you'll enjoy. So check that out next week. That'll be episode 114. Have a fantastic week, guys.